<laughs> what I did then is probably not relevant. <laughs> so let me do uh, what I'm calling recap of the semester. And there's uh, some value to doing a recap because when I'm covering topics initially, as we are going in a chronological order because we are uh, beings <laughs> that live in a linear time <laughs> and we only go in one direction in time. Uh, when we are covering topics that way, there's a certain order that I have to go in. I don't really have a um, freedom of choice in skipping certain things. Because as we are covering a certain topic, like for example, momentum, certain things are presumed um, to be in your tool bag. And, um, and, and that puts a constraint that I think is not always, always most uh, pedagogically sound, always most uh, conducive to sound understanding of physics. And that's where I think uh, the value of recap really is, because recap is a place where I can now ignore that order. I can reorder the topics, assuming you have seen them all, and kind of put the proper emphasis on the important things, just by the, in the nature of how they are ordered, not just by the amount of time we spent. So, so let me do that. Uh, I want to, um, so, Let's see, how do I want to title this? Let me call this um, Physics of 4A Recap. Recap is, I think, a short for recapitulation. But no one says that anymore. <laughs> so let me recap uh, what we have covered this semester. And um, the biggest thing I can say we covered this semester is really mechanics. This is the semester where you learn about mechanics. And um, there's a lot we can talk about and a lot we did talk about mechanics. And and um, and uh, I guess the, there's a phrase that I would encourage you to Google search, um, something called the mechanical universe. It's a way of looking at the world. And I don't mean to say that, you know, the material universe is the only universe, but the way we treat in treat the world in physics and science in general is with this um, assumption of a mechanical universe that all the phenomena we observe can be explained, can be um, can be planned, can be looked at mechanically, purely mechanically. And it for anyone who's religious or spiritual, I'm not, I'm in fact making no comments with regard to those non-mechanical realms. I'm just saying in science, we assume that everything that's relevant can be looked at mechanically. So that's our starting place. And, um, and as we consider mechanics, really the most important place that we started from that you might remember is Newton's laws. And Newton has many laws. We cover, in fact, four different laws of Newton. Uh, Newton's are three laws of motion, first, the second, and third law, and, um, and the Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, for the purpose of describing mechanics or the mechanical universe, what's important is the Newton's three laws of motion. And uh, even though we say there are three laws of motion, we do spend quite a bit of time with just one of them. And that's the Newton's second law, which says that net force is equal to mass times acceleration. This is the single most important thing that you learn and you learn to apply this semester. Um, this is... Um, and this uh, connects to another thing that uh, we talked about towards the end of the uh, sem semester when we were talking about oscillations. So, so you know, <laughs> the way the topics are ordered in the semester, they are quite far apart. Now, in this place of recap, I can show you just uh, how um, I, I can... Uh, I can um, put the proper emphasis just how closely related they are. So this is Newton's second law. And when we were discussing mathematics of oscillation, 
we talked about uh, equation of motion. And the way we obtain equation of motion in context like oscillations is through Newton's second law. Because we start out with, okay, my net force is the force due to spring, which should be minus, uh, minus because it's a restoring force, opposite in direction, times the spring constant, times the displacement. We'll just uh, set the origin appropriately so that x equals zero is equilibrium position. That's equal to mass times acceleration and and this is why we couldn't start the semester with the Newton's laws. We have to talk about the definition of acceleration, which is the time derivative of a velocity, which is itself a time derivative position. So double time derivative position, you have mass times the second order time derivative of position. And and this this being put together, you know, solve it for the highest order time derivative. This was our equation of motion, uh, minus k over mx. So double, double. This was our equation of motion in, in the discussion of oscillations. And that's just an example of this application. So um, from this uh, uh, simple expression, relating something that we call force, uh, push or pull, to um, something that we call acceleration, uh, the, or quantity that describes motion, um, we can get this uh, differential equation. And from this uh, differential equation, derive many properties of the system. This, uh, um, that's really mechanics. That's, uh, um, uh, a good chunk of the semester is just wrapped up in that. Um, so, so we have that, and um, and the uh, you know uh, there's the Newton's third law, and th there are other uh, important fun foundational concepts we can attach to Newton's first law. Uh, something to do with uh, a definition of inertial reference frame, and. Um, but I think at this level of class, it's not as important. So I'll just uh, uh, leave it for you to read on your own and move on. And in terms of Newton's third law, I think that's uh, easier to talk about if I bring in our next uh, topic of recap, which is dynamics. So we covered the Newton's law. So we covered the force analysis for some time, and then we had um, and, and then we introduced some new things uh, that's not directly about Newton's law. And I would do just to summarize it as dynamics, which um, I guess uh, let me not go too much into etymology because uh, trying to connect Greek words with the uh, modern use of those terms is really um, <laughs> it's uh, fraught with uh, pitfalls and um, false friends, false cognates. Um, so, uh, I mean, dynamics is worse from the Greek word dynamos, uh, meaning power, but like power is the least. <laughs> and that has to do with, you know, Greek use of the word power is not how we use the word power. So let me just forget about the Greek etymology and just talk about what dynamics is. And Dynamics is, I guess, um, it, it, there's, there are two pillars of dynamics. It's the energy and momentum. These are what some people call twin pillars of uh, classical physics, or twin pillars of conservation laws, conservation of energy and momentum. And uh, we introduce the problem-solving strategies that use them. And um, so, so these, these are the two um, most uh, meaningful quantities in dynamics. And momentum connects it directly to uh, one of the laws of Newton's uh, laws of motion. Uh, so momentum is the quantity that uh, most uh, closely related to, relevant with Newton's uh, third law of motion. And um, recall back in the lecture how we 
treated conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. And they were really heaven and earth. They were that different. With the energy, we started out with the uh, assertion that energy is conserved. And really everything we have done since then, such as defining things like work, we define the work as force times uh, force dot product with the displacement. Um, as a way to come up with a quantity that would be conserved through different mechanical interactions. And from this definition of work, we derived a formula for kinetic energy um, as one half mv squared. And we derived some, uh, some formulas for potential energy, which they all came from this relationship that potential energy is the negative of the work done by conservative force. Work by conservative force. And all these quantities we introduced, defined, built up, they were designed to do this one thing, that there's this one conserved quantity that we are going to call energy. Energy is a, it's a computed quantity. It doesn't um, like, um, I guess uh, one way to say it glibly would be if we never defined energy, uh, back, dynamics would stay the way it is. Like us not introducing the idea of energy wouldn't change the dynamics itself. But this is a, such a useful problem solving tool that uh, that we treat this as being something real. You know? and, and you know, and there are real effects that do come with energy. Like uh, when some of the mechanical energy turns into thermal energy, we feel that as a heat as things warm up, and it feels different. So I mean, but at its core, energy is a calculated quantity that's calculated and related to many different things by the way we treat it. Momentum. I call the way we treat conservation of energy momentum heaven and earth because how we got conservation of momentum is different. It's not a second quantity that we somehow designed that we should also conserve in addition to energy. Conservation of momentum comes straight out of Newton's laws from Newton's third law, which says that uh, if uh, an object A uh, or exerts a force on object B, then there's a, a counter force by object B on object A that's equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. That's Newton's third law. And conservation of momentum is a direct consequence of that Newton's third law. Um, and we do introduce some quantities like impulse that will help us, uh, that helps us uh, express this, uh, you know, impulse is defined as a force times duration of time. And this duration of time being uh, duration of interaction. So, um, so the duration of interaction with the two interacting bodies is the same between them. Uh, it's uh, kind of symmetric that way. It, you can't have uh, one that's ignoring force on the other while well, this is not because of Newton's third law. So, so we did this uh, introduction of the concept of uh, impulse. We can uh, we can express the quantities that relate to change of momentum um, more uh, succinctly, and and um, and and we see that if. Uh, if, if you only have internal forces, which depends on how you define your system, and the most important thing about internal force is that when you analyze the interaction between the two bodies, both the action force and the reaction force, they are in your system. So that as you look at the total change of the total momentum, that um, if a, on all the forces involved are force between the objects in your system, then those action reaction force pairs will result in impulse that's going to cancel each other out within the system. Now, once you have uh, external systems, once you have other objects that you're not tracking, then 
uh, conservation of momentum of that system is not uh, that that's not held, but that's only because um, it's getting momentum transfer from uh, outside the system um, or from or to the other outside the system. And as you look at this uh, uh, two different aspects of dynamics, energy and momentum, that's, uh, um, there's a lot of similarity and uh, differences that you need to watch out for. I guess the biggest thing is energy is scalar and momentum is vector. So the kind of, um, I mean, in this class, we shelter you a little bit because um, we uh, deal with the momentum in 1D so that uh, you only have to worry about positive and minus, but um, those pluses and minuses, they are not talking about increase and decrease. They are talking about direction. And um, in more generally, you have to talk, think about momentum in 3D. So, so we, you know, we covered the Newton's laws, we covered the dynamics as we were um, introducing and teaching mechanics. And I think that's it. I think that's uh, all the mechanics we've covered. I mean, I, I don't mean to say that's uh, everything we've covered. This is only like uh, four weeks of the semester. But um, these are the fundamental concepts. Everything else we do in the class they came from these fundamental things that we covered in these four weeks or so. The rest are either applications or prerequisite uh, mathematical content. So, um, so, so um, I, I don't know if I remember all the applications. Let me try to uh, let, let me uh, give it a try. Let me try to remember <laughs> all the applications of mechanics. So, um, uh, what things did we uh, um, apply these to? I guess the biggest thing where it's also uh, maybe a little bit controversial that I'm calling it application, not a mechanical topic on its own, is the idea of rotation. Uh, so rotation was an application of these mechanical concepts. And um, I, the biggest reason I have for uh, calling rotation an application is because in classical physics, basically there's no, no concept or no quantity in a rotational motion that you can't uh, derive from the um, translational motion, some linear motion. Uh, and be careful here, I said classical physics. Uh, for some of you, uh, when you take a quantum mechanics later, you will see that uh, there are quantities in quantum mechanics that relate somehow to rotation that don't come from uh, translational motion. So as we go from classical physics to uh, quantum mechanics, at some point rotation will be its own topic of mechanics. Uh, the, the quantum mechanical angular momentum is a really um, important quantity that governs many different interactions in physics and chemistry. And, um, and I want to draw a distinction there because when we introduce that quantum mechanical angular momentum, that'll be something new. That's uh, nothing like uh, what we've been talking about uh, other than by analogy. So I want to draw a clear distinction here that what we are covering now is just an application of mechanics. So um, in, in fact, the, the place where it's uh, kind of the easiest to see it is the analogs. Um, by analogs, I mean things like, um, so in the translational motion, we had a mass. Um, and in the rotational motion, we introduced rotational inertia. And in the lecture, we went through the whole derivation of that. And in the translational motion, we had a velocity or speed. And in rotational motion, we had the angular velocity or angular speed. And we went through the derivation of how it relates. And once you introduce all these different quantities that are analogous in the two different um, motions, then you can build up expressions in the rotational motion that are completely analogous to the 
to the um, equations that you had in translational motion. So for example, in translational motion, we had the momentum, which was mass times velocity. And in the rotational motion, we have angular momentum, which it's not the definition, but oftentimes it can be described as angular uh, rotational inertia times angular velocity. And we had a kinetic energy, which was one half mv squared. And the, there's a rotational kinetic energy, which is one half rotational inertia times angular velocity squared. Notice how these translational quantities are being replaced with the rotational quantities. That's what we mean by analogs, that this uh, rotational dynamics is built up in such a way that we can um, we can rely on relationships like this. That's uh, one of the things that should tell you, oh, it's uh, an application of uh, dynamics in the translational setting. And uh, so within the rotation, uh, let me pull out angular momentum as uh, its own thing. Uh, we did look at some examples where angular momentum helps explain some really counterintuitive motion like a precession. So I think it's uh, worth uh, pulling out as its own uh, separate application. Uh, let me just name precession. But even here, we can understand it through the same way we understand uh, linear motion quantity. So in linear motion, change in momentum is a force times the duration of time. Uh, that uh, what we talked about way here, and um, is kind of trend, uh, uh, analogizing it to the rotational motion, we can say that the the change in angular momentum, it's a vector, is equal to the torque times the duration of time. And um, this vector aspect gets quite complicated, which is how you get that wonderful uh, counterintuitive precession motion. But um, it is still just an application of what we've learned in translational dynamics. And uh, oh, and what we ended with was uh, static equilibrium. Uh, static equilibrium isn't really even rotation because we're talking about when things are static. But um, I guess it belongs in that category because you need a torque to talk about static equilibria and still application. Um, and then I think we had other things that are more, no one would dispute with me. As I say, they are um, applications of mechanics, uh, things like oscillation. Uh, we talk, covered oscillation, waves, and uh, these are quite uh, obviously applicational mechanics. It's a particular, it, you can almost look at it as a case study. We have a particular scenario, you have some defining parameters of the scenario, and to the scenario, we apply what we learned about mechanics. We apply what we learned about uh, forces and things like equation of motion. And we apply um, things like energy and uh, maybe not so much momentum, I think. <laughs> so energy and um, both of these are uh, wonderful. Um, wide-ranging applications of mechanical phenomena. And finally, oh, oh, this is another thing. I'm gonna put it under application of mechanics, but I recognize not everyone would <laughs> agree with me, uh, fluid dynamics. And I call this also application of mechanics because, uh, because uh, in covering fluid dynamics, we didn't have to introduce any new mechanical quantity. I mean, we did have to define some new uh, way of treating things, like we define the pressure as a force per area. We define the density as a mass per volume. But this was a, um, more of a dif different way of uh, dividing up things <laughs> so that you can uh, create a little fluid element. But once you have that fluid element and you are treating that uh, motion of that fluid element, then it's just the uh, mechanics that we learned before. So fluid dynamics is another application of mechanics. And, um, and that's uh, really what we spent the other 
half of the wait that's not quite enough oh oh i know what i forgot so we spent the time uh, covering mechanics and application of mechanics and uh, we spent time covering uh, time on a prerequisite or uh, mathematical ideas i mean uh, uh, let me put it in quotation because it's not really pre it's not prerequisite like a prerequisite course um, it's a prerequisite in that it's the things that we, you need to know. So that's why we covered it. But at its very core, it's not really physics because um, in talking about these things, we didn't uh, introduce any physical ideas. Uh, and the biggest of this is the kinematics. I used to half a joke uh, when we get to uh, Newton's laws. Uh, which is about fourth week in the semester that we are finally covering physics. And I say half joking because it's true. Uh, when we do kinematics, you know, we are talking about the uh, position as a function of time. We are talking about velocity as a function of time and acceleration as a function of time. And velocity is defined as the time derivative position. Acceleration is defined as the time derivative velocity. There's not a single physical idea here. I mean, it's a, really a mathematical description of a particle moving about. That's really all that is. And, um, it, you know, we did talk about certain problem solving approaches, but at, at its very core, it's, uh, kinematics is just the math. <laughs> the reason, and it, it's the very first thing we covered this semester. And the reason we had to, is because we needed you to understand what acceleration is for us to talk about Newton's second law without a preconceived or a notion or something we teach about acceleration. Newton's second law makes no sense. And this is what I mean. Uh, when we are first covering the topics, we are forced to, to go in specific order. So the whole kinematics formulas that's not what physics is about it's just that's just mathematical problem solving which is important but you know that's not what physics is about um, but you do need that as a basis so that you have on um, some intuitive sense of what acceleration is so that as we use acceleration in the description of our laws that that it makes a sense to you um, so, so yeah, we had that mathematical prerequisite, um, and uh, I feel like I forgot. Oh, you know, what? I um, Newton's law of universal gravitation. It's a fourth law of Newton, and I think I would actually. Oh, where would it fit? Um, hmm. You know, what? let me put it this way. Um, I'm gonna create a new category just for it, and I'm going to call it. Laws of physics. And my contention here is that we taught you exactly one law of physics uh, this entire semester. <laughs> and it's uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. That the force between two objects, um, M1 and two masses, that there's an attractive force between them. And the magnitude of that attractive force is given by some constant, or I guess the way Newton formulated it would be proportional to product of the masses and inversely proportional to the distance squared between them. And the G is the constant of proportionality so that we can make this equality. I'm telling you that this is the only law of physics we've taught you because um, the Newton's laws of motion um, it's not, I guess it's a, a question of what you consider to be laws. Um, so how, how do I, um, <laughs> let me give this a bit of a thought, how I should phrase it. Um, this is the uh, philosophical question that you might consider, uh, which is, how do you define a force? I mean, um, I did give the whole types of force lecture. I do have some sense of what force looks like. 
<laughs> uh, we call it push or pull. And you might say, oh, it's so intuitive. Yeah, push, push or pull. That's how you define a force. When something pushes or pulls, then we say that's a force. Then the question might be, how do you know something is pushed or pulled? When you have a contact force, then maybe it's uh, so obvious that it doesn't need an explanation. No more than, you know, typical math class, you'd hear an explanation of why one plus one is equal to two. It's so obvious that it doesn't need an explanation. Um, another way to say this, it's uh, axiomatic. It's uh, foundational. It is our starting point. And uh, in math, when we talk about axioms, axioms are not something you prove. It's something you assume. Because um, when you do your proof argument, you have to start from some place. And that place that you start from, uh, it, it, there might be a more fundamental things you can prove that starting place from, but you can imagine keep going um, further. And to, so what's the most fundamental thing? And at some point you hit bedrock. You hit bedrock of assumptions, <laughs> things that can't be proven from anything else or anything else that can be proven from other things. And Newton's laws of motion are like those axioms in mechanics. It's our starting place. Newton's laws define force for us. So that when we see forces like a gravitational force, which is not a contact force, we don't see it literally grabbing onto something and then pulling, like we don't see that, but, um, but we call it force because it causes acceleration from the fact that gravitational force causes acceleration. Uh, we call it force. And then you might say, that sounds so circular. And yeah, it is. And that's why I'm saying um, Newton's law of universal gravitation is the only proper law of physics we've taught you. Because everything else is either mathematical prerequisite, things you have to know to do quantitative problem solving, or um, kind of definitional concepts in mechanics. Even though we are calling it laws, it's not empirical law. It's not law like you to do an experiment to, to verify their truth of. Newton's law of motion defines <laughs> dynamical quantities for you so that you can further define other dynamical quantities that we have introduced. And um, so this semester, we really spend all of our time doing that, all of our time developing those mechanical concepts, um, which means we didn't have a lot of time to teach you real laws of, real uh, fundamental laws of physics other than this one, Newton's law of universal gravitation. This is the one fundamental law of physics that we've taught. Oh, oh, there's also Hooke's law, but that's not fundamental. It's just a kind of phenomenological description of spring force. So that's also not a real law. So, so yeah, this uh, uh, is a recap of the whole semester, um, which is the semester which is really about mechanics. That's what this entire semester is about. And uh, we've developed quite a bit of tools and these are all important tools as we further your study of physics. Actually, um, physics of 4B and physics of 4C will teach you many laws of physics. <laughs> it's just that you needed the tools that we teach you in this class in order to make a sense of those laws as a physicist, as a scientist, as an engineer can. Or, or should be able to. So uh, we spent a lot of time introducing these um, things that are not laws of nature, just how we choose to analyze nature as a mechanical universe. And we've um, given you some um, applications of these uh, principles. And, and, and we taught you one law of physics, Newton's law of universal gravitation. That is the one law of physics that we've taught you, uh, which you know you can't make do anything with except by using these principles. So, so yeah, that's the recap of the semester. Um, uh, let me know of any questions. I guess initially when I was uh, trying to 
do this, I thought I would use each one of these as branching point to, to talk about some of the other things, but I think I've already done that kind of. So, um, yeah, so, so let me leave that there. I might come back to this in a future virtual class session, but for now, I'll just leave it here. This is a recap of our semester.